I've had many failures in trying to do promotions or launch a product. And sometimes it's just in the messaging. Sometimes there's fault with the product. It's just something that people don't want uh, or they don't care about. But a lot of times it's, it's in how you're approaching the product. I've had stuff that's, com that's just failed miserably. And I, I sat back and what the heck, man, this is a good product. What do I do wrong? And I take a look at my, my if, if it's an email, I take a look at my subject matter. Like, you know what? Nobody was opening this because the subject matter was boring. It wasn't getting the attention or the first two paragraphs. Uh, I didn't convince them or I didn't say the message right. Or maybe it's the price. I was charging uh, 400 bucks and it should have been, uh, you know, people just aren't, there's no value. I didn't, I didn't explain the value in this and, and convince people that the price and the value are, are in step. So I, I got to lower the price or I got to make sure they understand the value more. So most of those can be salvaged uh, by analyzing, uh, analyzing things and changing uh, mid-flight. Uh, but I've had stuff that just flat out didn't work. And, and I mean, that's just part of business. You're going to have some things, you know, when Coke came out with New Coke, 30 years ago, you know, it, it didn't work. Um, so they, they went back to classic Coke. Um, that's probably the best example out there of it. Um, it is, uh, you know, so these things happen. Um, I, I, I've had countless times and countless businesses um, where, where something didn't work or, you know, I spent a lot of money on a promotion and I got one order or two orders. And other times, there's times where I, I like, ah, this may not work and I put it out there and boom, it just goes crazy. I'm like, holy cow, this is, this is kind of cool. It's like printing money. Um, so um, just expect that. Everything's not going to work um, and just get back up and, uh, and retool it or move on to the next thing. That's all you can do. Um, and just as a, a general sort of uh, zooming out a little bit uh, in a more of a business just context, um, very few businesses fail because they uh, run out of money or um, because the product isn't particularly good. I think if the founders have enough perseverance and there's a, a good interpersonal relationships uh, as relates to the founding team on the business, um, you can overcome almost any obstacle. Uh, so just in practical terms, if you keep the relationship together uh, and you don't stop trying different stuff and iterating if things go wrong, uh, eventually you'll arrive at a solution uh, like a rat in a maze or something that just sort of uses its scent to, to get to the end. But you'll never get there if, A, the relationship falls apart, or B, you just um, give up and stop trying stuff, uh, which is why, you know, in Disney movies, they tell you just don't give up and believe in yourself. Like, it's a, a very practical advice. Um, <laughs> so it it's, uh, can't be said better than that. In one case, um, a seller created a product that they had it manufactured. They didn't go through the proper testing um, you really have to do that when you're selling a product that you're manufacturing. So if you, and especially if you're having it manufactured overseas, um, if you don't get prototypes, if you don't maybe go visit the factory, I mean, there's a lot involved. But in this particular case, the item had a, um, the the color rubbed off of their product, and so they had a whole batch that went to the FBA warehouses, and they had to recall it all because so it was a great product, had a flaw. Um, didn't properly test it and then had to recall it all. So, I mean, it takes a long time to recover from that, t that type of mistake. Um, in another case, uh, I had a seller that launched a product and then violated TOS with, um, with their actual variations, their ASIN variations on Amazon, which is something that most people think they're doing right. I, mean, I, I talked to my compliance friends in the industry, Chris McCabe and Liam McHugh, particularly about ASIN variations a lot because people don't know that, I mean, not everybody knows that there's a certain way that you're supposed to list your, your variations on Amazon. And if you do it wrong, <clears throat> Amazon might think that you're trying to manipulate the system. There's a lot of that going on because there's so many what Amazon calls bad actors on Amazon. Um, there are people that are doing black hat things. There are people that are they're doing things that are against TOS. They're doing things to make it look like other sellers are violating TOS. So I, it's a really it's a really competitive space, but it's also kind of scary right now because there are a lot of black hat things going on. I have another seller who created a new product, listed it on Amazon, had a great plan, and then didn't have their um, like all of their brand registration in place and somebody jumped on their listing and um, <clears throat> ended up buying some of their product and then reselling it themselves. I've, I've seen people that have had their listings actually 
sabotaged by other sellers. Um, I've seen people that have launched a product and then somebody left a whole bunch of unverified product reviews on that product and it got the ASIN suspended. So th there's just a lot going on. Um, and, and there's a lot that can happen. That's not your fault as the developer of a new product, um, that can get you in trouble and can hurt your success. So with Amazon in particular, it's very important to follow the rules. It's very important to test your product. If you have a brand new product, it's very important to protect yourself and do everything that you can to protect yourself as a seller. The first one was a sports product and it was one product and quite expensive. Uh, it was a, a stretching bar. So a really good product, very, uh, very technical for golfers, tennis people and, and so on. But there was only one product uh, for a seller and it was very difficult to get the brand awareness or the enough traffic because with one product, you're fighting really on a very small uh, scale, let's say. Uh, and that was really, it, it proved itself very difficult to be successful and we had to stop the project. Uh, and now I know, I mean, if you've got one product and, and moreover, if it's a bit expensive, it's really difficult and you can do whatever you want. You do promotions, but you've got, it's too little to attract people. So that's the first one. The second one was on the Nutriment brand. Uh, and that was in Europe. Um, the difference between Europe and the U S is that U S you can enforce map pricing, at least outside of Amazon. In Europe, it's forbidden to have map pricing. You can't talk about pricing and you can't f enforce anything um, because they can call the police basically or, and they, you'll, get, you'll get a fine. Um, so uh, some of the brands have a distribution which is a bit disorganized or they don't have control over the pricing. And we did splendid listing. We spent a lot of time to do all the optimization, everything. And then 80% of the time you lose a buy box or 90% of you lose a buy box because everybody's 20 or 70% cheaper. Okay, so that's where, back to the thing I was saying, you need to have, what's your plan? What do you want to achieve? If the brand doesn't want to follow and decrease their price and face value, then you need to give up and say, okay, we, we, we need to clear our distribution first and maybe I can't do it now for whatever reason then I need to give up e-commerce because it's just impossible because the, the pricing mechanism of Amazon is too, is too good to fight against it. So you, it, you just, you have great products, but you won't be selling. Um, and, and for a brand, you could decide that was a, a vendor and, and all the competitors were seller sellers, but it's same if you're a seller and you're selling to others and you're not controlling the pricing. And it's sometimes complicated in Europe because the one guy is in the UK, one guy is in Spain, one guy is in Poland. So it's very difficult to control all of that. So if you don't have a very rigid pricing structure, it can, you can say, okay, I'm giving up because I, I can't get that right and I don't want to fight the price war on Amazon. One of the products that we see that didn't work out uh, very well um, on, on Amazon was uh, it was a travel-related product around keeping your valuables safe but it kind of incorporated clothing at the same time so that the unique selling point of this product was keeping your valuables safe with hidden products. But people weren't particularly searching for keeping my valuables safe with hidden product, hid, hidden pockets. Um, and that, that was the point of this, this product. That was its USP. And to the outside, it just looked like a normal um, item of clothing, basically, but it was, double or triple the price because of these extra benefits and that's the kind of reason that that it didn't didn't turn out particularly well because people weren't searching for that those two things together if you like so when you put the two things together the price was too high so people weren't buying it because they just thought it looked like a an expensive you know they could get the same products in their eyes for half the price because they weren't they weren't valuing the extra features of this product. We, we chose a great niche, but we chose a really bad manufacturer. Um, the product was a sous vide. Uh, I don't know if you know what that is. It's like a, uh, it's a cooker. Um, okay. So there's like, uh, what it does is it sits on the side of a pot and it moves water around your steak that's in a bag or salmon or veggies. And then afterwards, you sear the meat or fish or food. Really hot, 
fad. I mean, it's still very popular now today. And we got our our butt handed to us on that one. So we ordered a uh, thousand units, and then we launched literally like two weeks before Prime Day, the first Prime Day. So we ended up getting to the like third position on the main keyword, and we had every single problem hit us basically. Uh, competition shut us down for a false IP complaint. So they were saying that we were using their images, but we weren't. And so then we were down for 10 days. There isn't really much you can do about that, uh, except for just a appeal for it and then wait out the 10 days. Well, during that time, we had, we had all these sales beforehand, but during, during that time we had returns come in. So as soon as we got back up like, and running, we were shut down by Amazon saying our return rate was too high. And then as soon as we got that taken care of 10 days later, we had uh, one of our buyers have the product actually melt on them. So, I mean, it was just a horrible, horrible experience. Uh, definitely makes makes me think of like, hey, I, I can't be doing these type of products anymore. Like, A specific failure case would be, you know, we have a seller who – introduces some products, has outrageously good profit margins. We were really excited. You know, CFO Tyler is pumped. And what we realized is that he had very little cash reserves. He was uh, doing what we call co-mingling his finances, where he was paying his personal rent and paying his business expenses out of the same account. And it turned out that he had not done his proper, I guess you'd say due diligence on a couple of his products and he was infringing on someone else's trademark. And so he went from being a wildly profitable product to three months later being totally out of business. And uh, we've seen many less dramatic stories where, where sellers just run out of money where they can't fund purchases. They get burnt out and they go get a job. I think that's the most common failure story is you just you do this thing for a year, realize that you can't make enough money doing it to actually support your family. And so you, you find a job and you kind of let it right off into the sunset. But, you know, in terms of spectacular failure, we saw that, that gentleman grow really, really quickly, you know, get a cease and desist letter from an attorney and run out of money all within about a two, uh, two month period. Another pretty specific failure story. Um, and this is one that's pretty common is if you're in a partnership, not having a good partnership agreement, not understanding who gets to spend money, not understanding, uh, who gets to make decisions if you're uh, if you've decided to get into business with your buddy you need to put the the specifics of that business arrangement into an operating agreement because if you don't as soon as the numbers start getting bigger as soon as the as the as the profit and the sales numbers go up it's amazing what can happen to those friendships they can, they can get a little weird right <laughs> and so you know, I would say that that's probably part of the honest story with my healthcare company was part of the reason for my exit was that my business partner and I, who are who I still love the guy, we're, we're, we were, were lifelong friends, but our partnership wasn't organized enough to, to really handle the level of growth that we had. And I've seen this with the e-commerce sellers and that they maybe take some money from their parents to help fund the business. And dad's now a minority partner in junior's business without any clear understanding of who gets to make decisions. And again, as soon as things get tight, dad pulls the plug, the business goes under. And that uh, it's just important to have the hard discussions up front. In fact, I would say if I've made my biggest mistake as a business owner, now I've, I've owned two companies and have run another business. My biggest mistake was not having the courage to have difficult conversations with my business partner early enough in our relationship that we could fix those issues before they got out of hand. 